this passage is a driving test, you know, the first time you've ever gotten into a car. <laughs> Alex, back for some more MCAT podcast, breaking down this week the start of a, a new kind of series, I guess we could say, uh, breaking down Blueprint MCAT Diagnostic, uh, the dreaded diagnostic. Last episode, we talked all about why students should take it, when they should take it, what they should think about it, um, but we're going to jump in to the diagnostic now. Any any big tips for someone jumping into that diagnostic? They're going to take it this weekend. It's going to be their first time sitting down for several hours to take a test. Any any big tips on how to handle that sort of kind of mental preparation for the test? Yeah, exactly. As we as we touched upon last week, right? It's like, you know, it's like getting into a car for the first time and taking a driving test. You know, you're going to see a lot of things that you either recognize from undergrad but don't really remember, or that you feel like, I've never seen this before, or oh my goodness, how am I, on earth am I supposed to answer this question? Just recognize that all of that is completely normal. Yeah. Right? I, think it's, I think it's a kind of a strange and kind of uncomfortable experience for people to be taking a test and to feel like they know very, very little on it. Yeah. That is, that's how it's supposed to be, don't worry. Like, it would be strange and unusual if you did know everything on it. Okay. So, typical full-length um, section-wise is about 59 questions, I believe, for, for the kind of normal s sections. Um, the half-length is, I think, 30, so uh, about half of, of the number of questions. Is that about right? Yep, that's about right, and okay. uh, which means that if you do it and keep all of the normal break timings, it'll it'll take you a little bit more than three and a half hours. The the opening to chem phys, uh, I'm assuming the passage uh, kind of orders the same: chem phys, cars, bio, biochem, and then psych soch. So we start out here with the chem phys, thirty questions. Get ready to rock and roll, starting with passage one. Yeah, passage one, all about. Oral drug delivery systems, and uh, Ryan, I know I know this has come up on the podcast before, but I think it's so. I think one of the big things for the MCAT is recognizing that they're gonna throw a bunch of words at you from that see you know that you've never seen before or that seem to be in areas that you know nothing about, right? And that's I think this is kind of doubly so on the diagnostic because maybe you're not quite yet sure exactly what areas of content the MCAT does and does not expect you to know. But I often think the MCAT is an exercise in using what you know to figure out what you don't. And this is a classic example here, right? You know, oral drug delivery systems and floating drug delivery, you know, uh, mechanisms, right? This is not, this is not like, you know, there's no blueprint module on this, yeah. right? You're not expected to know anything about them, but we can, you know, you can use the content knowledge that you are expected to know or that you will be expected to know to puzzle out the answers anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and, uh, and read this passage here. Oral drug delivery systems are limited by the short gastrointestinal transit time leading to low bioavailability. Drug delivery systems able to retain the dosage form in the stomach are needed. Research into floating drug delivery systems may satisfy this need. Right. I feel like they've thrown a lot of words at us right off the bat. And but this is a very kind of classic MCAT paragraph one, which is it kind of identifies the scope of the passage, what we're talking about. We get kind of a and I think in like classic science paper fashion, we kind of get, oh, this is, you know, conventional, you know, conventional thing with, con you know, with the with a problem. And here is something novel that may solve that, which is to say, you know, oral drug delivery systems. I assume that means, you know, pills or, you know, liquids, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, they're not very bioavailable because they don't spend a lot of time in the, you know, in the GI system, right? Maybe if we have drugs that float, it'll solve <laughs> this. Yes. Fl drugs that float, not drugs that sink, <laughs> whatever that <laughs> means. <laughs> All right. um, and again, and it's like, again, you know, are you expected to know anything about floating drugs when you walk into the MCAT? No, but you are expected to know about, you know, 
drug absorption in general or and about buoyancy. So immediately, if I were reading this from the perspective of an MCAT expert, I would say, oh, like this is in the physics section. Like we're almost certainly going to get something about buoyancy or about density here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all I think about are the TV shows and movies that show people flushing drugs down the toilet when the cops show up. <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to picture, are those floating before they flush? Are they not floating? I don't remember. They won't, they won't, they won't go down. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's rock and roll. Would you, would you highlight anything in this first paragraph? Yep, I would highlight oral drug delivery systems uh, are limited by. So, and that would, uh, that would kind of flag to me that... We're talking about limitations here. Like, yeah, that is to say, conventional, you know, conventional thing with its conventional limitations. Uh, and then I, and then I would highlight floating drug delivery systems as the kind of possible solution to this. Move on to paragraph two, uh, FDDS, which we know from the previous paragraph is uh, is an acronym for floating drug delivery systems, can be approached by either effervescent or non-effervescent techniques. Ideal effervescent techniques achieve floating duration times of greater than 16 hours in the stomach. Effervescent FDDS incorporate gas, gas generating agents which provide buoyancy. Newer research focuses on non effervescent systems where the swelling of polymers joined to the drug entraps air within the polymeric matrix, providing buoyancy to the dosage form. Ooh, a lot of, lot of syllables in that one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so how would you break down this one? I would categorize this in my mind immediately as like, okay, so in the previous paragraph, we had floating drug delivery systems. And in this one, we kind of get like two subtypes. Mm -hmm. And this is really classic for the MCAT where they'll give us, you'll, they'll give you like, here's this thing. Oh, look, it's divided into two subtypes. Um, I would highlight uh, effervescent and non-effervescent. Okay. Um, <clears throat> aside from that, I wouldn't highlight anything else because I would know that if we wanted any de any details on effervescent and non effervescent techniques, well, then we'd know kind of what we'd know where to look to find that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do just like to take a point to comment. It is amazing that they can that you can achieve uh, greater than sixteen hours in the stomach. If I'm remembering <laughs> correctly, like average gastric emptying time is like two hours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. Like all all I can picture are like. Um, little like claws going out and like holding on like i don't want to go stop the peristalsis <laughs> no don't send me to the intestine <laughs> <laughs> the the duodenum how about the do won't don't odnum <laughs> oh. oh man all right mm -hmm. enough, enough have you that. met the pancreas he's a real jerk <laughs> <sighs> All right, oh. so uh, let's keep rocking. Yeah. If you go on to the third paragraph, we have, like, immediately, right, first four words of this, of this third paragraph. And, like, these, like, in any science passage, right, on any section, right, they, it, like, lights up in my mind. A study was performed. Mm. Like, that's kind of classic science writing. It's in the passive voice. You know, who performed the study? Who knows? Maybe it performed itself. Uh, <clears throat> a study was performed on the anti-diabetic sulfonylurea glipizide. The drug and one of three polymers were mixed in a mortar according to the ratios described in Table 1. A drop of water was added and the mixture was kneaded until a homogeneous paste was obtained. It was then placed in an oven at 50 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes to remove water. The compound was then compressed into tablets, which served as the basis for drug release and buoyancy measurements. And this is really crucial, right? Because I think this paragraph fills out like what is either our first or maybe is one of several uh, paragraphs, which we'll find in almost every experimental science passage, right? Where the researchers are actually doing and studying something. And this is a classic method section, right? They are trying to answer a question, which is to say, are floating drug delivery systems useful or could they be useful? And we get the methods here. Presumably this is how they're going about answering that research question. Mm. Uh, I would note as well in this, uh, just kind of mentally, which is to say we got those two types of, uh, of floating drug delivery systems in the previous paragraph, effervescent and non-effervescent. 
and I would note here that oh, interesting, they're they're clearly researching the non-effervescent type because we you know were told in the previous paragraph that non-effervescent systems use polymers, and in this paragraph we get it's that we're mixing the drug with a polymer. Yeah. Okay. Anything from the the chart, uh, this table here to break down to think about? How do you break down these tables? Yeah, this is in general in science. I don't like to look at tables a whole lot until I get a question. Mm. I often feel like a real um, like a real unifying experience among uh, people studying for the MCAT is you know you, they feel like you know you pour over a table for what feels like five minutes and then. Every, you know, none of the questions ask anything about it. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, why did I look at that? Uh, these were all pseudo discrete questions that had nothing to yeah. do with the passage. Yeah. And, but, you know, I do think that's relevant to being a doctor in the sense that, you know, patients might tell you lots of information, <laughs> not all of which is relevant. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. That, that happens. Uh, yeah. So I okay. would look at table one and I would note that we get the drug, glipizide. We get a bunch of different polymers. I would note that it says density. And again, you know, like I said earlier, and that, you know, the word density would light up in my mind because I'd be like, well, we're talking about floating here. And I know that density is one of the key properties that determines buoyancy in any given, in any given liquid. Uh, sorry, for any solid object floating in any given liquid. And I would note here that we apparently did several trials, but I wouldn't I wouldn't advise I wouldn't dig into it any more than that before we got any questions. Okay. Right. All right. In terms of what I would highlight from paragraph three, I would highlight a study was performed and the drug and one of three polymers were mixed. Because again, the rest is specifics. And there's no, there are no points for memorizing these kind, this kind, these kinds of you know data on the MCAT, right? It'll always be right there, like just like it is on your screen. It'll always be right there on the left hand side to reference. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to the next paragraph, we have to test in vitro drug release of solid dispersions. The tablets were placed into dissolution vessels containing 900 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl. Dis dissolution studies were carried out for one hour with samples withdrawn at predetermined intervals. Drug concentrations were assayed using HPLC methods. The dissolution experiments were carried out in triplicate and the results are shown in figure one. In vitro buoyancy was also tested. Tablets were placed in a vessel containing 500 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl. The time taken for the tablet to rise to the surface of the dissolution media floating lag time and total duration that the tablet remained on the surface total floating time were recorded <laughs> oh my that's quite that's quite a lot there yeah um <clears throat> i would highlight the first the first sentence before the comma right to test in vitro drug release of solid dispersions we're getting more methods here right they're telling us what they did yep yeah, so this right. is this is all te uh, like research setup type information. Yeah, and it, I get I, and it's setting us up as well for what we could possibly expect to see in the results. Mm -hmm. Just to say, these are all the things they're measuring, but maybe you know it's no, that's not necessarily like what the passage itself will present to us. Very often, you know, these um, these passages are extracts from scientific papers, yep. and scientific papers offer measure a great many things, and maybe the AMC will only choose to present one of them to you. All right, so then we see this figure here. Yeah, we have drug release as a function of time and pill composition, right? With any... You know, this is our first graph on the diagnostic. And I always, when I look at graphs, I like to pay attention to what the x-axis is, what the y-axis is, and what the different groups represent. And in this case, our x-axis is time in minutes. The y-axis is percent glipizide release. And we know from our methods that glipizide is the drug that's being studied here. It's the one that's being mixed with the polymer. And we have three different trials, and I, you know, those trials come from table one, and it looks like these different trials, they all seem to release glipizide differently or at different rates. That is to say, you know, we have one line which seems to show lower release after 60 minutes and one line that shows somewhat higher release after 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. I would note that they're different. I wouldn't necessarily dig into it much more than that. 
Okay. Okay. Fine. Finally, we have the KSP for glipizide cyclodextrin in a chyme solution at 37 degrees Celsius was determined to be 5.8 times 10 to the negative 4. Increased solubility of drug dispersions may be achieved by wetting via hydrophilic polymers or by polymer size reduction. I would highlight here the KSP for glipizide dash cyclodextrin because we get what we get here is our KSP. And I think this is one of the little one of the hooks can be really scary when you're taking the diagnostic for the first time. KSP refers uh, to the um, solubility constant of this particular um, for this particular um, mixture. Uh, sorry, for this particular drug polymer combination mm -hmm. and this ties into equilibrium chemistry, which I think for many people studying for this test, you know, possibly they took months or years ago. So, you know, maybe it'll tickle something in your brain, be like, oh my goodness, I knew that, you know, two years ago during undergraduate chemistry, but my goodness, I don't remember how to apply that now. Yeah. I always recommend whenever you see anything on the MCAT that you don't remember completely or that hasn't come, you know, that doesn't, that isn't entirely springing to mind, not to panic because it hasn't asked you a question on it yet. Okay. <laughs> don't panic uh only panic when you see the question <laughs> <laughs> then run around the test center screaming <laughs> yes disturbing everyone else there okay so we get to the end and then we go okay uh do you do you have any sort of mindset shifts when you go from reading the passage to then jumping into questions when I jump into questions, I think of every question as, you know, this is especially true on cars, but this is absolutely true in, the, in, the, in, in every section, which is every question, it's like a game of hide and seek. Mm. Like every question is pointing at a component of the passage, or it's pointing at a component of your prior, co uh, prior content knowledge, mm. or it's pointing at a mixture of both. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And your job as an MCAT test taker is to identify like what it's pointing to, like go find that piece of information, either in the passage or in your brain, you know, bring it up and either, you know, apply it or mix them together and pick the answer that's correct. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So we get into question one here. Um, and question one is which of the following correctly lists the floating lag times for the three trials in increasing order. Note, assume that the mixing of the drug and polymer does not change the density of either component. So rephrasing this question, they want increasing order of the floating lag times. And we had a, a description. We didn't highlight it here. Um, I don't think in terms of floating lag time was up. Uh, where was it? Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. This is paragraph four. Right Display here. The time taken for the tablet to rise to the surface of the dissolution media and total duration, uh, blah, blah, blah. So the time that it took for that tablet to rise to the surface is the dissolution, um, is the floating lag time. So we have this um, glipizide release figure one here, and then we go, okay, I don't see anything about floating to the surface in terms of uh, Y axis or X axis. So now I'm mad because if they said which one is the increasing order of glipizide release, I'm like, oh great, that's easy. <laughs> let me just let me just um, uh, kind of uh, reference this figure and I'll be good to go. So now, as you mentioned earlier, right, in terms of the MCAT and it's kind of this critical thinking type um, game that you have to play with it is, in, in my mind, this question is asking me to go, okay, w how would floating lag time look in this figure based on glipizide release and time? Am I thinking about that right? Yeah, exactly, right? Which is to say, I, I think you've correctly identified there that kind of they haven't presented us with all of the researchers' data, 
yeah. right? Because it says they measured floating lag time, but we don't see that presented to us. Yeah. And I would read that and say, okay, well then we must be able to figure it out another way. Because if we weren't able to figure it out another way, then the AMC wouldn't be able to ask a question <laughs> about it in the first place. Yeah. So in my mind, this whole discussion uh, about floating lag time is, is really... Um, this floating d drug delivery system is all about increasing the time that it takes to um, to break down a specific medication, so that it's in our system for longer than uh, we we swallow the pill, it dissolves, and and we're done. So for me, th that would mean floating lag time is represented by a slower glipizide release. That's how I would break that down. And so I would go three, two, one in terms of looking at this figure as the increasing order of lag time uh, or actually decreasing here. So increasing order would be one, two, three. Um, that's how I think I would answer that question. Mm -hmm. So... C is the correct answer. Yes, that I would choose C as the correct answer. Um, trial three is less than trial two is less than trial one in terms of uh, lag times. Yeah, so I think there's a great key. Of course, the key word right here in the question stem is floating lag time. We need to know what this is. I would look at that in I would look at that in in our methods paragraph, right? Where they tested the in vitro drug release of solid dispersions, right? I would look at the definition of floating lag time that's given to us. We have it's the time taken for the tablet to rise to the surface of the dissolution dissolution media, right? So we're dropping this tablet into this container of liquid, this container of what looks like relatively dilute hydrochloric acid. So we're dropping this tablet into this container of liquid, and then we're measuring how long it takes for it to float back up to the top. And to me, I would say, well, what's the primary determinant of how quickly something will float? It's its density. Mm -hmm. Right. If I think of it, you know, if you think of I have a, I have a block of wood and I have a balloon, right? Both of these would float in a swimming pool, right? But if I push them both down to the bottom of the pool and then let go, the balloon will rise up to the surface of the pool much more quickly because mm. it's much less dense, right? The, you know, assuming they're of equal volume, you know, to get into the physics, the buoyant force upon them is the same, but of course the balloon has much less mass and therefore it will accelerate much more quickly, right? As, as Newton tells us, <laughs> <clears throat> right? So I would look at this and say, they've kind of dressed up this scenario up with a bunch of kind of fancy language and we're talking about pills and in stomachs, but it's effectively asking us which one of these pills will just float the fastest. Mm -hmm. And that means we're looking for the pills with, uh, we're looking for the pills with kind of the greatest and the least density, right? So that's how I would kind of distill out what this question is asking. And then I would say, well, floating lag times in increasing order. I'd be like, well, if a pill rises the fastest, well, it'll have the lowest density, just like the balloon in the pool. So I'd be like, all right, so what should be in first place in this list? It should be the pill with the lowest density, right? Where do we get density information? We get it in table one, right? We have three trials here. It looks like we're mixing in different ratios, these polymers with this drug, and we get the density of the drug and the density of the polymer. And it looks like you know, trial one, trial two, trial three all have a different ratio of drug to polymer. Which I don't know, right, Ryan? This seems like seems like a lot of math. Well, I I, I want to challenge your thinking because you're answering it with table one. I answered it with figure one, and mm -hmm. maybe I answered it incorrectly. Now that we're talking about it, but this question specifically says assume that mixing the drug and polymer does not change the density. So to me, the question is actually telling you ignore table one. 
Oh, this is yeah. I think that's a that's a great that's a great point, right? Because you know, assuming it doesn't change the density, why does it matter? This is actually crucial to answer this question, right? Because if you assume that the mixing of the drug and the polymer does change the density of either component, well, then we can no longer do math to figure out what the average density of the pill is given its components, right? Because if we mix its components together and it changes the density of them, well, then we have no idea what the density of the final pill is, and we can't correctly infer its floating lag time, how long it takes to rise to the surface. If we look at figure one and what it tells us, it's drug release and that doesn't directly tell us anything about how quickly it rises to the surface of the medium, right? Maybe it's the case that the pill that rises the fastest will also dissolve the least. But remember, these, you know, possibly these pills are staying in the stomach for 16, 15, 16 hours, right? They're floating for that much time. We cannot conclude anything about when we initially drop the pill into this solution, you know, we can't conclude anything about how quickly they'll bob up to the top immediately from how quickly their drug is released over an hour. Yeah, see, that, that's very interesting because I I got the right answer by making that assumption. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I and I, I would think of it as like you know if you have anything floating in a thing of liquid, right? How long does it take to float up to the top? Probably on the order of seconds, but figure one is over an hour. Yeah. Yeah. It, very interesting. Okay. So I read question one, and, and I see where where I made the mistake with with the that note. Assume that mixing of the drug and polymer does not change the density of either component. I was ignoring that last part of either component, which basically said it's okay to look at fig, uh, at table one and look at the densities of each individual component and assume that this is just a density question and go, okay, polymer uh, 188 is is the lowest and then the cyclodextrin uh, is the second and the, the other one is the third and that, that's the order, three, two, one. Um, and so I, I understand that. The way that I answered it was, was making that assumption that um, we want things to float, right, faster Mm-hmm. Um, which will get it out of, uh, at, at least from a surface area perspective, again, making lots of assumptions, uh, it gets it out of this hydrochloric acid that we have in our stomach. Um, and that's going to delay the release of glipizide, which is how I was interpreting figure one to answer this question. Yeah. And I think that's so tempting to do on MCAT <laughs> questions in general, because what the AMC, I mean, what Blueprint, but what the A has done here, but what the AMC will also do is, I think of it as they, they wrap these physics concepts in so much biology and so much experimental design that it can be difficult to kind of see the physics question at its core. Mm. Um, you know, I, and that this is why, and this is actually a relatively recent shift in kind of how the AMC tests, you know, science content, right? If you go back to maybe 2015, 2016, you know, this question may have been phrased as you have a steel ball and a wooden ball and, you know, a balloon, right? All of equal volumes, which one will rise to the surface <laughs> of a swimming pool the fastest? But, and they've moved away from that in recent years, more towards this, like, you know, ah, oh, it's not, it's not a steel ball in a pool anymore. Now it's a <laughs> pill in a human stomach. <laughs> yes. You have a drug and a polymer. Yeah. Uh, okay. Very interesting. So yeah, maybe I'm just too smart for the MCAT because I still got the right answer, I think. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think you just have a natural intuition. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe it helps. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, the, um... <laughs> So looking at the looking at the densities of these pills, we would we could take a weighted average of this table. Of course, this is a drug to polymer ratio. So you know, mm. it, if we look here at say trial two, we know that this pill is one part glipizide and four parts beta cyclodextrin. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we could do a weighted average to figure out its density. You know, it'd be um, it would be like by you know taking oh okay, it's one part one part glipizide, which is zero point two grams per milliliter, and four parts beta cyclodextrin which is 0.3 grams per milliliter so i'd be like oh okay so its density will be between those two but probably closer to beta cyclodextrin because it's you know because it's by because it's made up much more of beta cyclodextrin you know four parts to one part 
Uh, but I would look at this and say, figuring out that for all of the three trials, that's kind of a lot of math that's going to take a long time. Let's see if I can just figure out what's first. Yeah. Uh, and I would look at this and be like, well, what's the, what's going to be the shortest floating lag time? What's going to rise the quickest? It'll be the least dense. It'll be the least dense pill. Yep. And I would look at this and say, well, polexima 188 is by far the least dense polymer. And it makes up a much higher proportion of the pill in trial three than the other polymers do in any of their trials. You know, it's eight parts polymer to one part glipizide as opposed to trial one, and trial two, which are one to one and one to four. Yep. So I'd be like, well, this 0 0.1, this very, this very, very low density polymer, it's making up almost the entire pill, which means... I know it'll be less dense than any of the other trials. So whatever the case, trial three will be the first thing in this list. That's all we need. Sees the correct answer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all I can picture when you when you gave that explanation is is uh, a, a, a man standing with one balloon, a one-to-one -one mixture, versus a man standing with 100 balloons and, and starting to float up into the air. <laughs> because there are more balloons. Um, all right. What? And I really like that. I really like that analogy as well, because actually, you know, like what is a, you know, even balloons in air. I mean, what are we all but walking around at the bottom of a deep, 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 deep swimming pool filled with air that we call the atmosphere? Yeah. Right. You know, the laws of buoy you know, buoyancy applies in air just as well as they do in water. We just don't think about it in that way. Yeah. Yeah. What is, it reminds me of that. What is water? Um, uh, kind of poem uh, thought thought experiment all right question two go ahead and jump into this one yeah so this is a kind of i think this is the kind of mcat question that many people expect the mcat to be filled with and actually these kinds of questions i mean they're not they're not rare but i actually feel like they are the questions which at least for many people they get right kind of you know, they start to get these kinds of questions right before they start to get the kinds of questions like question one right, which is to say, you know, question one was actually quite a nuanced problem solving question. You know, there are a lot of steps that we went through to get to the correct answer there. But for question two, it's it says telazamide is an aromatic drug with a similar sulfonyl urea structure to glipizide, which of the following is most likely telazamide? Right. This is much more a kind of direct derivation of content knowledge. Right. Do you know your functional groups? Do you want to <laughs> have a crack at it? Uh, do I want to have a crack at it? <laughs> um, uh, so the the only crack that I have is, oh, they all have S's. So I'm, I'm lost. <laughs> so that, that's all for group. Yeah. I, I, I have no idea how I would go about that. Um, so urea, obviously, I think is this NH group. Um, uh, a and D are the most similar because they have uh, these two NH groups. Um, uh, answer choice A here has this uh, ring attached at the end with another nitrogen there. Uh, and then B and C are more similar uh, with just the one NH. Um, so I I wouldn't know if I were a betting man. I would go with um, I, I would just go answer choice D um, and move on. <laughs> but I don't know why I would choose that. And that's and that's great strategy, right? And the that's that's perfect because if you're in a situation even on test day where you look at this and you say i don't remember what sulfonyl urea means right i have you know i don't remember the functional groups involved and i can't dredge them out of my memory the correct answer is to the correct answer is to guess and not let this second take another second of your time yeah right Remember that on the MCAT, you don't have to get every question right in order to get an amazing score, right? <laughs> I did not get every question right on my MCAT, not even close. Yeah, that's good to know. Good <clears throat> to remember. Yeah. Um, if I were approaching this question, I would, I would say, okay, so it's an aromatic drug. So I'd expect to see a ring and not just any ring. I'd expect to see a ring of delocalized pi bonds, which is to say a ring that has those kind of double bonds in it as well. So I would eliminate D for that reason. It does have a ring, but it's not an aromatic ring. Darn it. Uh, 
The most common aromatic ring that people are generally familiar with is benzene or uh, phenol has one as well. Mm. In fact, the uh, aromatic nature of the ring is why phenol is so is one of the reasons phenol is so acidic. Fun fact. Uh, <clears throat> right, and then you'd be you'd be fun at a bar. Fun fact. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's fine. Cocktail party conversation, right? <laughs> um, but I would say, and then I would look at the. It says it has a similar sulfonyl urea structure to glipizide, right? This is effectively, do you remember what a sulfonyl group is and do you remember what a urea group is? You did identify uh, the uh, um, carbonyl group. We, if we see it's in, uh, it's in A and it's also in D, a carbonyl group that has uh, those two ends branching off it. So uh, the definition of a urea group is a uh, carbonyl group with two organic amines branching off on either side. So both A and D have that. And from those two pieces of information alone, we can get to the right answer because we already eliminated D because it didn't have an aromatic ring. So A must be our correct answer. So close. I, I was between A and D for some reason. Um, but that, that aromatic ring got me. But it's, and it's a great indication. So a sulfonyl group uh, is also an A. It's that sulfur that has the two oxygens double bonded to it. Yep. Um, this is a great indicate. This is a great case actually where we didn't need to know what that was to get this question correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on to question three. A student preparing for the experiments inadvertently adds an additional 400 milliliters of the same acid solution to the dissolution vessel. What will be the new pOH of this solution? Oh, I love experiment questions. So we had, let's see where some of this information is. So for someone looking at this going, okay, um, if you have 400 mLs of the same acid solution, we started off here with 900 mLs. Um, and then we added 400. The question is, does that change the POH of the solution? I don't know. So I, I'm looking for POH anywhere in uh, any anywhere in the passage. There's no pH, no POH discussion. All we know is that it's hydrochloric acid, which I know is super, super acidic. And so I'm just going to guess that it's just going to be super acidic. I'm just going to choose A and move on. And and I don't know if that's reading that right or not. Uh, I love your train of thought. You are incredibly close. <laughs> okay. The, I, I think this is a great one because I think this is a great, this is, an, this is another example of how the MCAT can take concepts that are straightforward in our minds initially and then almost like kind of wrap our brains around themselves so in this case like this is one of those i, I thought about this and i was like wait would this change the ph and i was thinking about it i was like well like i don't know if i have a glass if, like, if, if i have like a glass of distilled water on my on my uh on my desk right do you remember what the ph of that is seven yeah exactly and then if I say, all right, and into my glass of distilled water, I pour another 100 milliliters of distilled water. What's the pH now? Seven. It's still seven. Yeah. Because pH is a unit derived from concentration. So yeah. if we just add more of the same, well, then of course it's pH won't yeah. change because pH comes from the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution. So... I think the they inadvertently add an additional 400 is, is a huge red herring in this question. Yeah. Because you could just cut all of that and say, what's the what's the POH of the solution? It's not a new POH. POH it's exactly the same. Yeah. So I got that part. Yeah. What, where did my thinking go wrong? I'm assuming it's what is POH versus what's pH. And I just ignored that part. <laughs> Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be answer choice D, isn't it? It's going to be the opposite. It is. Oh. Exactly. Yeah. Darn it. So we have a, and that, and the, but that was, that was a great inference, right? That this is probably, this solution is probably going to be quite acidic. Yep. Uh, POH is kind of the, it's like pH is kind of less often used cousin um <laughs> but they are they are inverse to each other so something with a low ph something that's very acidic will have a high poh and that's because when we sum them together they'll always sum to 14 mm. uh 
so if something has a pH of 1, it'll have a pOH of 13. And this is because, for chemistry reasons, the concentration of uh, high H plus ions and OH minus in solution are kind of um, always linked to each other. If you increase one, you decrease the concentration of the other. And yeah, so the way would calculate, well, the way I would calculate this is I would calculate the pH. Okay. Uh, hydrochloric acid, HCl, we know our concentration here is 0 0.1 molar. Uh, to get our pH, uh, HCl is a strong acid, so this will just completely dissociate. So our final H plus concentration will be about 0.1 molars. Um, we would take the negative logarithm of this to get the pH, um, which is to say that I think off taking logarithms for many people first approaching the MCAT can be very scary, but I would look at this and say, well, 0.1, that's 10 to the negative one. Yeah. Uh, the logarithm of 10 to the negative one is just its exponent. So it's negative one. What's the negative of that? It's one. That's our pH. Yep. What's our pOH? It's whatever you have to add to that to get 14. 13 D is the correct answer. Yeah. So I, I got the answer, the, the wrong answer, by just looking at the answer choices. And one was the only like truly acidic um, super acidic thing that I would assume hydrochloric acid would be without doing any sort of logarithms and stuff. And I think that's where students, they they get a little scared because they look at something like this, they hear the answer that you just gave and go, well, I'm not going to have time to do logarithms or the logarithms scare me and blah, blah, blah. Like, no, like just use some common sense too. And eventually you'll get to the right answer. For me, I, I got the the wrong and the right wrong answer uh because i just i i forgot what poh was and i was just ignored it yeah and i and i think but i mean if we if you let's say you were short on time i think we could absolutely have used a shortened version of your strategy which is like eh, it'll probably be pretty acidic yep. acidic things have a low ph but they have a high poh ah 13 that's pretty high like choose it and move on you know yep. if you only had say you know five you know 15 seconds that you could work on this question <laughs> yeah if you're running out of time there you go. All right. Question four. Uh, we have the flow rate of stomach content emptying is 100 cubic centimeters per second. Uh, patients who undergo gastric bypass surgery will increase this rate to almost 1600 cubic centimeters per second. Assuming the flow of stomach contents approximates uh, Poisil's law, I believe that's how you pronounce that. Uh, <clears throat> what change to their gastrointestinal connection would explain this provided no other changes occur in the conditions of stomach content flow? Ha ha. So, um, this is, um, oh man, this is it, it kind of looking at this, uh, on the surface, it's like, um, putting putting your thumb over the 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 hose, uh, yeah. I think is kind of where it's going to. Although it's a, a little bit different, obviously, because uh, that's a different principle, isn't it? Um, do you know what that one is? Uh, uh Bernoulli's. That's Bernoulli's. Yeah. Um, sorry, I had to like sorry, I like paused for a second. I was like, <laughs> looking looking it up in my brain. Yeah. yeah. Bernoulli's um, principle. Yeah. So this one is going to be different obviously we have different answers and not just um make the hole smaller uh and things will come out faster so we are <sighs> in no sorry no sorry we need to cut that it's not Benoli's principle no. Benoli's principle is that the pressure drops with increased velocity uh this is um uh it's uh a1 v1 equals a2 v2 it's like it's like uh it's the flow continuity equation. Okay. Whatever you say. All right. <laughs> All right. Oh, so sorry. can't 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 give your good listeners false information. Yes, that that wouldn't work well. Um, so looking at this, right, it says the flow rate of stomach content emptying is one hundred cubic centimeters per second, and that increases to almost 1,600 cubic centimeters per second. So to me, it's moving faster or is it moving slower? It seems like it's moving faster, is it not? Which doesn't make a well, ton of sense. 
I think it's worth noting that this is where that this question is giving us the flow rate, not like the flow velocity. So it's not necessarily moving faster, but we are certainly getting more flow per second. Okay. I don't understand what that difference is, but I'll, I'll go with it. So there's, there's more volume, not necessarily faster. Is that? Yeah, yeah. There's more... Okay. There's more, there's more stomach liquid going through per second. That's not necessarily the same thing as the stomach liquid is moving faster in like meters per second. Mm. And I like to think of this as like, you know, if you have a, if I'm squirting liquid out of a syringe, for example, if it's a very small needle, well, then the velocity of that fluid might be quite high. You know, it might spray a really long distance, right? That in meters per second, it might be going really fast. But that's not necessarily the same thing as spraying lots of liquid per second. It, it might still take a long time to, like, fill up a cup. Yeah. Okay. So I see 1,600, and four times longer, four times larger seems like an easy kind of uh, way to get to 1,600. So I'm going to get rid of A and C just because of that without knowing any laws of anything. And I'm just going to go, it's, I think it's B or D. And I'm just going to pick D because I don't know why. But knowing gastric bypass surgeries, I don't, that's not what happens. So <laughs> I think it's B, but I want to pick D. Uh, that was perfect <laughs> guessing strategy and exactly what I would advise a student to do in your situation which is to say if you don't remember what Poiseuille's law is then D would be my guess as well as the most reasonable choice here yeah right I I would say I would eliminate A and C because I'd be like well two times longer I think it's worth noting for these questions we need to think about the relationship the change involved and you 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 know you you got to use you know we go from 100 cubic centimeters per second to 1600 right so if we're doing something to the length of the connection or if we're doing something to the radius of the connection, well, if we, you know, if we were to increase the, you know, increase it by four times and it went up by 16 times, well, then we know that this relationship is a square relationship because 16 is the, is the you know, is the square of four. Mm. If it's two times larger, so two to the four is 16. And honestly, in physics, it's very, very, very rare for equations on the MCAT to have uh, to have exponent terms, like to have anything to the fourth power. So we have Poiseuille's law here, which says that flow is equal to, you know, the difference in pressure, right? The pressure differential across the pipe uh, multiplied by pi, multiplied by the radius of the pipe to the fourth power. And that's where that, you know, that's where that, um, where that's where that fourth uh, power comes in. Uh, divided by eight, multiplied by the length of the pipe, multiplied by the viscosity of the fluid. So if we look at what this equation predicts, we would assume more flow if we either increase the pressure difference across the pipe, which makes sense, right? You know, more pressure, more, more liquid flow. Uh, if we increase the radius, and we would expect that increasing the radius would have a huge effect on flow uh, because it's to the fourth power. Yep. Or increasing the length of the pipe would decrease the flow or increasing the viscosity of the fluid would decrease the flow right and this because they're both in the denominator and this i feel like kind of intuitively makes sense like it's probably you know harder to get a high flow rate if we're using maple syrup versus water yeah that makes sense um and if we increase the length of the pipe i like to think of this as well you're kind of adding resistance I mean, to kind of tie it into cardiac function, we know that our blood pressure is a function both of the uh, both of the cardiac output of the heart and the resistance provided by all of the, all of the blood vessels, right? Yep. Which is to say, you know, kind of adding more length of pipe to that the liquid has to flow through would very naturally kind of provide a degree of resistance that would oppose that flow. Yep. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so with this in mind, the new connection radius is two times larger. C is the correct answer here because, of course, two to the fourth is 16. But if I didn't remember that, I would pick D because those kinds <laughs> of relationships are extremely rare in, in, on the MCAT. Yeah. 
All right. So. <sighs> and actually, uh, 55% of all students uh, agreed with you on this one. As they should. As they should. As they should. Um, okay. Interesting. So this is a one where you just, it's, it's one where you just have to know that law. You just have exactly. to know it. Yeah. And, and questions like this on the MCAT, I mean, they're not, again, they're not super rare, but it is... This is like, this is not an enormously uh, commonly tested piece of content, and questions like this, where you just have to know the equation or you're completely out of luck, are many, many, many questions are not like this. Yeah. And again, if you saw this question and you didn't remember what the equation was, I would strategically guess like you did and move on as quickly as possible. Okay. All right. Um, last question here for this passage. Uh, question five. When in vivo studies were performed on the three drug polymer combinations, it was found patients in the Polexamer 188 group experienced the most stomach pains after administration. Given the results of the study, this is most likely due to A, elevated drug concentration causing inflammation of the gastric mucosa, B, tablet fragments causing inflammation of the gas, uh, gastric mucosa, C, glipizide polexamer 188 matrices being the smallest of the three tested, or D, increased pH of the stomach contents. So I'm going to immediately get rid of D because I don't understand why that would change it all based on um, the drug. Completely agree. Um, so uh, hopefully I have increased my chances here. Um, elevated drug concentration causing inflammation of the gastric mucosa. I don't know if that is a good answer either because the drug is the same. The concentration of the drug is the same. It's the uh, polymer that's going to be different. So I'm going to get rid of A for that reason. Potentially. B, tablet fragments causing inflammation. Like, I don't, I don't remember where they talked about fragments of stuff. And I don't, I can't assume that like, ooh, it's going to break and whatever. So I don't like B for that reason. I don't like C just because I don't know what matrices are and anything else. And what does that matter? But it's the one that I'm left with. So I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't know where I went wrong or I just, uh, went right. I don't know. Yeah. So this is, this is, this is what makes this question really hard is this is a, this is a most likely question. Yeah. And I always like to highlight those words whenever they appear in a question stem, most likely, mm. because to me, they signal that the MK, that this, the question is going to take a, a step away from maybe what is really concretely discussed in the passage and is asking you instead to speculate which of the following could cause one of the you know could cause this result given the information you know from the passage so these are prime questions to solve with elimination because the correct answer will probably not be directly supported but hypothetically if it were true could lead to the situation that we're that we're given in the stem mm -hmm. Um, so I like to think of these most likely questions as again, almost like the, the MCAT giving you an excuse to speculate and the wrong answers will be wrong because if they were true, they would either not lead to the results that the question stem gives you or they conflict with the passage information somehow. Okay. So, so in, I got rid of D first. I would completely agree. I think your reasoning for getting rid of D was great. We have absolutely no reason to assume that these tablets have any effect on stomach pH. And even if they did, we have no reason to suspect that they would affect pH differently. Okay. Apparently it's only Polexima 188 that experienced the most stomach pains. Yep. Uh, looking at the breakdown of student answer students answering this question as well, it's a basically 25, 25, 25, 25 split. <laughs> Uh, which to me, sh which to me says not that twenty five percent of the people taking ta uh, taking this question knew the right answer, but that probably almost nobody did because this is the statistically expected random distribution. Mm. Okay. 
<clears throat> so my next one was getting rid of A, where I looked at that and I said elevated drug concentration. But looking at these, the drug is the same concentration in both. Am I wrong there? So elevated drug concentration causing inflammation of the gastric mucosa. So the amount of drug in each, uh, you know, the amount of drug may be the same. But I think what's worth noting here is actually if we look at Plexma 188, it actually had the least glipizide release. So if we think of this drug dissolving into the, into the gastric fluid, mm -hmm. like, again, compare it. This is a classic, like, it conflicts with the passage. Yep. I mean, if anything, it would have the lowest drug concentration yep. compared to the other trials. So why would it create the stomach pain? So A doesn't work in that regard. Okay. So I got rid of it for the potentially the wrong reason because figure one goes against what uh, A is saying. Exactly. Okay. Right? C could an elevated drug concentration cause inflammation? Yep. Maybe, but that doesn't explain why it happened in, pole in the Polexima group as opposed to the other ones. Okay. So the way that you were talking about the most likely, how to potentially think about that, let's make some assumptions and, and see. I like answer choice B better when you talk about that because sure, if for some reason this uh, mixture was fragile and would break, um, then yeah, potentially that would cause some inflammation. Yeah. And for that reason, B is the correct answer, right? Which is to say B is consistent with the observation that it dissolves the slowest, right? We can see in figure one, the uh, Peleximod is trial three, which is those little yep. diamonds. And it does, re it does release the slowest, right? B is consistent with this because it's like, well, you know, it's again, it's most likely. So could B be true? Yes. It doesn't conflict with anything in the passage. If it were true, would it lead to the results in the question stem? Yeah, possibly. B is the correct answer. Okay. What are the matrices here that it's talking about in C? Yeah, the glipizide Plexma 188 matrices are the smallest of the three tested. So I would knock this out for a couple of reasons. I would say that we... I don't remember anything in the passage about matrix size specifically, yep. other than polymer size reduction in the final paragraph, right? That sentence says increased solubility of drug dispersions may be achieved by wetting via hydrophilic polymers or polymer size reduction. This implies that reducing polymer size would increase your solubility. But we already know from the passage that this Plexima uh, trial dissolved the slowest so if this were the case, that would imply that its matrix was larger than the others, not the smallest. Okay. All right. So we get through passage one, just barely. This is our diagnostic. This is our introduction to the MCAT. Um, that was a rough first passage. Yeah, exactly. And I promise, you know, if you're in the situation where, you know, if you're listening to this podcast episode, having just taken the diagnostic, as I imagine a great many people are, right, it can feel really, really discouraging. But, you know, like we, you know, like we said in the previous episode, right, this is, you know, this passage is a driving test, you know, the first time you've ever gotten into a car, <laughs> right? As I hope has come across, there are lots of when I, you know, I, there are lots of, when I see a question like this, I immediately think this, right? There yep. are lots of patterns of thought and strategies that you can internalize over time that will make breaking down these questions into what they're actually asking much more straightforward. 